Welcome to the Freedom from Anger podcast. Thank you for tuning in. This is my, I guess it would be post Thanksgiving podcast. I meant to get on here and do a little Thanksgiving podcast. Didn't quite get around to it, but I have a really great episode here with Dr. Katrina Wynn. We discuss medicine, her family history of being refugees to America, her book, nonprofit, a little bit of everything. That's why it's 50 minutes long. So hopefully you can stand to listen to me for that long. It's uh, very informative. I hope you enjoy it. Hope everybody is having a good, safe Thanksgiving. Hopefully there wasn't too much family turmoil or disagreements. Hopefully you got through unscathed, had a lot of good food, and trying to catch your breath before good old Christmas gets here. It seems like it, uh, as soon as uh, October hits, and Halloween, it's just nonstop. So, you know, take some time for yourself. Take a deep breath. If you need anything from me, please visit my website, freedomanger.com. If you realize over the holidays you might have some, some anger issues or some things to talk about, you know, be more than happy to do a free assessment consultation, you know, kind of see where it goes and um, help you on your journey of self-improvement. Maybe that'll be a New Year's resolution. Who knows? Or maybe you identified a family member that might need my services. <laughs> so either way, I'm here to help. And um, even if you just point them to my podcast, um, that's that's better than nothing. Uh, hopefully it's helping you out there. Enjoy the reading comments suggestions for episodes suggestions for guests that you might have please hit me up you can go to my website find all my information on there you can email me directly james at freedomanger.com but yeah i should have another podcast before christmas and i will definitely try to get something posted specifically for christmas big fan of december um that's my birthday month, so looking forward to all that. Another year older. It seems like time just keeps going by at a record pace. So enough of me uh, yammering on. Please stay tuned and listen to Dr. Wynn. And as always, stay safe. Welcome to the Freedom from Anger podcast. I'm joined today with... Katrina Wynn. She's a doctor, an author, speaker, and nonprofit founder. She has a remarkable story to tell, and I'm excited to have her on today. How are you doing today, Katrina? I'm doing great. So just we've talked briefly about various topics and things, but I'm really interested in learning how your family background and coming to America. So in April, April 30th, 1975 was after the fall of Saigon. My um, dad took me and seven other um, siblings and my mom on his fishing boat. And that was our escape to find freedom in America. But we didn't really know how it was going to happen. We just knew we had to take the chance to go out to sea and hope that we'd be rescued by a humanitarian ship. After several transfers, we were on a merchant humanitarian ship and brought to the Philippines, and then eventually was flown to Guam, which is our first U.S. settlement. And so th that was about May 8th of 1975 when we were in Guam. And we spent probably uh, about two years there when my little sister was born there, and eventually was sponsored by Catholic Charities and brought to New Orleans, uh, Louisiana, where my little brother was born. So I'm one of 10 children. I was 14 months old when we escaped communist Vietnam. I nearly died twice. Once during the transfer to a ship where I almost fell into the ocean. And the second time was being very ill in the refugee camp that re I re was required emergency surgery. So that's my background, my story, what inspires me to help people. I just feel that starting there very early in my life was many times where I had second chances to make a difference and just to be alive, to figure out what my purpose is in the world. Oh, yeah, that's amazing. And your family benefited from the kindness of a 
volunteers, nonprofits, people just trying to help out during a very difficult time. And I can definitely see the connection with you wanting to get into that field and becoming a medical doctor. So what's your specialty as far as the doctor? A pediatric gastroenterologist. I graduated medical school in 2002 and then did a combined residency of internal medicine and pediatrics and a three-year fellowship in pediatric gastroenterology. So I finished my fellowship in 2009. And so that's how long I've specialized in this area. Currently, for the last over four years, my focus has been on faith-based care and telemedicine. I'm licensed in seven states, and um, quite often, even though I live in Illinois, many times patients from outside of Illinois reach out to me for second, third, fourth opinion. I think the nature of medicine right now is just, especially with telehealth, to know that you're not limited as a patient to only see the local doctors if they're seeking alternative opinions and acceptance of alternative ways to provide care. It's been powerful just to see how God works to bring the people to me and to see the connections of what we have in common and how I can be uh, of help to those who are seeking healing. Yes. Yes. The telehealth thing is, I mean, it's huge. When I do my classes, I've worked with people all over the country and in different countries and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of skeptical at first as far as the telehealth thing. Mm -hmm. And I was like, man, this is very convenient for me. It's convenient Mm -hmm. for them. I I was too. When I first heard about telehealth over a decade ago, traditional medical training required that in-person and physical exam and all these things. And But as I developed in my career, I realized that the most important thing in 90% of cases is take a good history, which you can do by telehealth. And in some cases, you may have to arrange for an in-person visit, procedures, things like that. But that's quite rare, in that, especially in pediatric gastroenterology. And so we can always initiate uh, some workup, you know, and parents often are concerned about, you know, inflammation, cancer, infection versus something that's more like a food allergy, intolerance, or anxiety as far as it relates to my specialty. So I have learned, especially in 2020, when most health systems and physicians and nurses had to learn how to do telehealth, it wasn't a choice anymore. And when I discovered that this is the future of medicine lies in this option that will never go away, that's Mm -hmm. when I focused my attention on that. Oh, yeah, we definitely, 2020, everybody had to learn because... uh, (laughs) I never even heard of Zoom until 2020. It was rare that I had to attend a Zoom meeting. <laughs> yeah. Now it's just, I mean, I, I don't tell how many trainings and stuff that I've done through Zoom since mm-hmm. 2020. And it makes it a lot of times it's more affordable mm-hmm. than having to travel somewhere, than <clears throat> taking a hotel room. And if you're doing the two, three day trainings and workshops mm-hmm. and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, you, you're definitely right. I, I don't think it's, ever gonna go away uh like telehealth is definitely here to stay Mm -hmm. yep that convenience and i think um also you know for people who live far away um it saves them that travel time gas money taking a whole day off from work also being in waiting rooms with other kids and adults that may be sick when they're just here for a well annual visit well check annual visit or maybe they just need a follow-up, a refill on a prescription. Why do they need to drive an hour just for that when they can just do it by Zoom? So there are certain things that I've discovered that patients just appreciate that option. And it's nice to hear that level of gratitude to know that there's this option and there's certain things that can be cared for just by a virtual visit. Yes, whether it's physical health or mental health, there's a lot of companies out there now that does counseling to tell I think that's great it's a great option it's cheaper it's people it's more accessible because uh, I'm down here in Tennessee and we have some very very rural counties and they don't really have access to to services the only access they have it it's got to be virtual it has to be mm-hmm. through, through telehealth but like you said if not then they got to travel an hour just to get a prescription for the, the sniffles. Yeah, for sure. So tell me about your nonprofit. When did that start? 
My nonprofit uh, is called Faithful to Fitness. It was established November 6, 2014, and it is focused on helping to reverse the childhood obesity epidemic in America. Prior to starting that nonprofit, which is based in Loves Park, Illinois, I had worked in Augusta, Georgia, and collaborated with a medical resident who is currently a pediatric gastroenterologist in Atlanta. And we applied for a grant through the American Academy of Pediatrics that gave us almost $3,000. And what we did was instead of focusing on treating and preventing childhood obesity in the office or the hospital, we took it out to the community and invited community partners like gyms, chefs, dietitians, grocery stores, farm, uh, to fitness instructors, right, to um, collaborate with us and provide certain services that may otherwise not be afforded by the, the people we serve who are low income, uh, have, you know, a, a, a issues accessing a gym membership, a green space, or learning what's healthy, portion sizes, access to healthy foods and uh, fruits and vegetables, access to a dietitian that insurance may not cover. So those are little things that are barriers I identified that often affected people's um, ability to develop healthy lifestyle changes. And then when I left Augusta, Georgia in June of 2013 and moved here to Illinois, I felt like that grant that was given to us is basically only given to projects where it can be replicated across the country and it's not specific to a hospital clinic. So when I came here, I said, if I can do that in Georgia, I can do it in Illinois. That's when I formed my nonprofit for that purpose. Oh, well, that's, that's great. Definitely something that a lot of people need to learn is the health and fitness and things of that, of that nature. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, with fattest country in the world, you know, <laughs> and, and I could definitely, uh, lose, lose a few pounds. I'm, I'm very well educated in nutrition. I just don't pay attention to it. And, uh, my doctor keeps getting on to me about, I want to lose a few, <laughs> <laughs> you're no longer in your twenties. Yeah. You, know, you might want to keep a check on that. Uh, I think all of us can always strive to get healthier in some way. Um, I, I can always be more active, can eat more fruits and vegetables, drink more water. You know, um, there's always something that we can improve on. So I always tell my patients and also people I serve in my nonprofit, is just pick, a, pick one thing that you want to change, focus on that goal, be consistent with it for, you know, a month or two. And then after that, you set the next goal. When you set too many goals at once, you probably won't achieve any of them. And one of the phrases that's out there is, if you change nothing, nothing will change. So if the one choice you make is, let me uh, cut out all sugary beverages, that's a start, right? And for children in particular that I work with, that's the most challenging thing for them is drinking lots of sugary beverages like sodas and Gatorade, Powerade, you know, juices. So we have to kind of educate them on, it's better to eat that apple that gives you the fiber and the skin and the nutrition and the vitamins versus drinking apple juice. Yeah, and I'm a firm believer in that, you know, especially here in America, and it's kind of going all over the world. I, I, I'm, we're addicted to sugar. Mm -hmm. Our bodies, it's like everything we take in converts to sugar. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I'm a firm believer in that because, I mean, when I look at an old picture of, like, an old yearbook of, like, my dad's from the 50s. Mm hmm you don't see overweight people. Mm -hmm. And I think it was probably, when did they start loading up sugar? Probably the 70s. Mm -hmm. It's like you started getting like the sugary cereals and stuff like that geared towards mm -hmm. kids and yep. Cokes and Pepsis. And I, that's my, I'm a, I'm a yeah. huge Pepsi drinker and I just, I mean, a lot of advertisement too yeah. that's targeted at children and also in the evenings when you're about to have your meal and all these commercials are on TV talking about, you know, making you hungry, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> to say, I haven't prepped a meal, maybe I should go get that. But uh, certainly sugar is very, very addictive. And, and so we focus on that as a, a first goal, typically, that we encourage people in our nonprofit to, to try to achieve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. Uh... One of my old doctors, he, he, he's since retired, but um, he became a vegetarian. 
-hmm. And I asked him, I was like, well, like, what was the toughest thing for you like to give up? And I want, I wanted him to say meat and stuff. He's like, no, I stopped drinking Cokes. Mm -hmm. He said, that was the hardest thing for me to give up. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, it's I definitely, cause like I said, it's the sugar, it's the caffeine. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just the that one, two combo. But yeah, I mean, the majority of foods we have has corn syrup in it and mm -hmm. all the bread. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I remember I heard somewhere that Subway's bread, there was so much sugar in the bread that they were actually mm -hmm. calling it cake. Oh, really? It's actually classified as cake because there's so much sugar in the bread. I've spoken to people who, you know, lived here in America and then moved, you know, to Europe, for instance, and they eat the same food, even the same portions like pasta or rice or, you know, bread. They can eat it every day in Europe and they don't gain weight. Uh, for several reasons, one is the ingredients that are used to make there is different, and they also are much more active. They don't drive around. They take transportation uh, publicly and walk a lot long distances. So, you know, the environment and the food sources and how food is prepped and what ingredients are there make a huge difference on how addictive. Oh, yeah, definitely. I know when I traveled overseas, it was, it was very interesting because you go to like a McDonald's, like mm -hmm. in Japan, and say you get the large. Well, their large is like our small. Yeah. Like it's tiny, you know, it's like, what's going on here? And it does taste a little bit different, like within Australia. I've been in Australia, Japan, mm -hmm. various places. They have the similar stuff, but it's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. But the portion size is a lot smaller than it is here in mm -hmm. America. So. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Might have something to do with it too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I've traveled with my husband. We stopped at places in different countries in Asia. We've been to Japan. I've been to Italy. I lived in the Caribbean for almost two years in Mexico. So when you talk about those types of foods, we always come back and say, well, that was different. Same food tastes different, you know, <laughs> not <laughs> doesn't seem as like addictive. And like you said, the portion sizes are a little different. Yeah, I remember me and a buddy of mine, we went to Tokyo, mm -hmm. and of all places that we decided to eat, we ate at an Outback Steakhouse in Tokyo. <laughs> it was re really, really taken in the culture. <laughs> yeah. That was like another buddy of mine. We were doing some training in Southern California when I was in the military. Literally, we were 15 minutes from Mexico, and he wanted to go to Taco Bell. <laughs> I was like, man. I was like, there's <laughs> food trucks everywhere and Mexican restaurants everywhere, and he wanted to go to Taco Bell. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> yeah, let's see. He's loyal. So... What are your thoughts on, so you're a gastro person, medical doctor. As far as getting checked, things of that nature, I heard a rumor a while back that people are getting checked at an earlier age. People are coming down with uh, a lot of issues at a mm -hmm. younger age that most time it would be older individuals. Mm -hmm. Do you find that to be true or? When you say checked for weight management or colon well, cancer screening. Well, good. Colon cancer screenings, screening, things of that yeah. nature. Well, there are certain professional societies that have lowered the age for colon cancer screening in adults from 50 down to 45. It's a recommendation. It's not a requirement for doctors to do it. It's not anything insurance mandated. There are non-invasive screening called Cologuard that I've actually had done uh, in the last year or two. And uh, I turned 50 this past February. My husband's 52. So he went ahead with the colonoscopy and I went with the non-invasive testing. There are certain criteria. So if you have a family history of colon cancer early, it wouldn't be recommended to do the non-invasive. And certainly, you know, we typically, for adults, because I take care of children, but for adults, if you have a family member 
would say, let's say colon cancer at 30, it'd be recommended to screen earlier than the first, the youngest person that had that cancer, sometimes like 10 years ahead. So even those guidelines that are standard, it doesn't necessarily apply to everyone. The risk factors in your family and other symptoms like bleeding, weight loss, poor appetite, abdominal pain, those are all things that may uh, push a doctor to recommend earlier screening and more invasive testing earlier. We don't deal as much with uh, colon cancer in children unless they have risk factors like inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease, or ulcerative colitis. Also like small intestinal lymphoma, if it's like gluten-related celiac disease, if they're non-compliant with a gluten-free diet. So those are some examples. Other things that are similar between adults and GI, adult GI and kids is like reflux, constant acid reflux, and it's not treated, then that will increase the risk for esophageal cancer. The other thing related to obesity that we screen for is liver cancer, because uh, obesity increases your risk for not only type 2 diabetes and high blood pressure, cholesterol, uh, heart disease, for instance, but also liver disease related to fatty liver, fat accumulation in the liver, causing inflammation and increasing the risk for liver cancer, just like any other cause like alcohol, hepatitis B or C. Fatty liver disease can also increase your risk for cancer within the liver. And it's one of the leading causes of, especially for children and adults with obesity, increasing their risk for the, the liver cancer. So those are kind of some screening things we look for. And, you know, we think screening for colon cancer at 50 was young. What well, think of liver cancer, looking for it even in kids. Yeah. Yeah, it's new that they, they were talking about lowering the age of that. So I'm definitely mm -hmm. in that ballpark. So I'm like, uh, okay. <laughs> but it's good, it's good to ask your physicians about that option, whether you're a good candidate for non-invasive testing, testing your stool for certain markers of inflammation. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. well, kind of interesting because I was at the grocery store a couple of days ago and one of the, the magazines where you check out was the actor James Vanderbeek, mm -hmm. the Dawson's Creek guy. And mm -hmm. Said, oh, he's got stage three colon cancer. And he's like, mm -hmm. not even 50. Mm -hmm. well, I was, so I asked my wife if she heard about it. And she's like, yeah, I heard something about that. And we looked it up. And, and she's like, when are you going to get checked? I'm like, don't think I have to. <laughs> I'm too young. <laughs> too young. Yeah. And also, you know, look at your, your diet and lifestyle. So certainly I always encourage a high fiber diet. That is one way to reduce your risk for colon cancer. But, you know, just like anything that can contribute to inflammation in your body, like smoking and alcohol, for instance, or just some example. So if you feel like personally, if somebody says, look at your risk factors and your lifestyle and your diet, and you have concerns and, you know, bring those up with uh, your doctor. And some people will actually ask the doctor to send them earlier than normal for screening because they feel that they have more risk factors than other people. Oh, well, my diet is horrible, so I probably need to get screened for everything. I, I love to cook and stuff, and I always typically don't cook the uh, the healthiest things. But yeah, I've had some health issues throughout the years, and I'll, I'll get healthy, and then I'll get unhealthy. For a while, I was actually on an anti-inflammatory diet, so mm -hmm. that was kind of interesting. Um, mm -hmm. Basically, cut out all the things that I enjoyed. <laughs> just, uh, a lot, a lot of fish and vegetables. Kind of remind me of the Mediterranean oh, type mm -hmm. diet. Me, just guessing, I'd say ninety percent of our uh, health issues is some kind of inflammation. Big balls of inflammation mm -hmm. rolling around because mm -hmm. arthritis, any kind of itis is inflammation. <laughs> <laughs> and certainly uh, for GI conditions, we look for that. Inflammation will raise your concern to screen for cancer yeah yeah like i said i'm very knowledgeable in health and <laughs> things of that nature i just need to buckle down and do it <laughs> <laughs> oh so you're also an author yes so yes. tell me a little bit about your, your book so i've published a memoir in december 2020 with hilton publishing and it's called live to give 
an inspirational memoir about freedom, faith, and selflessness. In fact, if you look here on the back, uh, that's the my little poster board that I, I take to book signings. And it's just, I put it here in my office as a little reminder to focus on inspiring generosity and find ways to do peer gives every day. But it shares the story of my journey as a refugee and growing up in America with parents who struggled and how I overcame the challenges of being a refugee and still finding ways to succeed, even though my parents, neither of them were fluent in either their native language or in English. I share that also many stories within my uh, book where I felt like God called me to help people and even in forming my nonprofit or in my career, there were people brought into my life so that I can help achieve goals that I felt being called to do. So it's faith-based stories as well. And, you know, in the end, we want people to feel that when you have encounters in life, you meet people, there's always a reason and try to seek that reason why you are part of their life and why they're part of your life. I see that in all the connections I've made with my nonprofit partners as well, because we find a common passion to make a difference in the world through fitness and health and impacting the future of children's health because of preventive opportunities. After publishing this and speaking and doing podcasts and live events and teaching, I got invited to co-author two books. One was published in January of 23, and it's called The Confidence of Yes. I wrote a chapter in there and collaborated with 11 other women, shared stories of why we said yes to what we do in our career. And then in October of 2023, another co-authored book with 16 other women. Again, each of us wrote a story and focused on, it's called Overcoming Mediocrity, Epic Women. We just share times where in our life where we overcame challenges personally and professionally to identify our true purpose and becoming successful and overcoming personal challenges to also get to where we're at right now. So it's really very inspiring personal and professional stories from women that also men enjoy reading as well. So that's how it's happened. But along the way, I met people who also enjoy speaking and sharing their stories and uh, trained with several speaking coaches since 2022. I, and do you do a lot of the speaking engagements or? I do. Sign book signing, speaking engagement, lots of podcasts. Just in the last 10 days, I've had four podcasts and a book sign. <laughs> so I keep pretty busy on top of doing telehealth and running my nonprofit. Lots of times I do speaking because there's an interest in my nonprofit work. Sometimes it's just mm -hmm. sharing my book and inspiring generosity. Sometimes it's my refugee story. Other times they want to learn about telehealth and faith-based care and why I navigated to that versus just working in the clinic or hospital and being comfortable with a salary versus approaching it from an independent practitioner and creating my own way, my own art of medicine in terms of approaching patient care. So those are different ways, but well, you know, I am here to, to inspire the audience where the host is looking for certain things that I can offer. When you say faith-based care, could you elaborate on what does, what does that look like as mm -hmm. far as faith-based care? Yeah. So in July 2020, when I left a, the comfort of a salary job at a hospital, about four months later, I was listening to a presentation by the, the co-founder of My Catholic Doctor. And basically, she shared that she was building this telehealth group that is focused on pro-life supporting women and children and for women to choose life. For me, also, as far as faith-based care, I don't focus, you know, my specialty isn't on women's health, OBGYN, but certainly being able to embrace your Christian values in terms of practicing medicine, which is not as friendly to the Christian community currently. So those are things that we've discovered. At first, when I left and I thought, wow, am I the only one that feels like I can't embrace my faith fully in my career? And I find out there's like, I think currently about a, over 170 of us who were not recruited. We just happened to encounter a talk or go to a meeting and we're like, wow, this exists. That's how we all came together in different specialties and different states. 
practice in a small way at some clinic or hospital, have some privileges. Did you find that when you were working the salary job at the hospital, did you feel that you had to almost hide your faith to not be kind of singled out or? I would say that not so much hide my faith. I mean, I think at my cubicle, you know, I had things mm-hmm. there that pre- pretty much knew. They knew like I was part of the Catholic Medical Association and where I stood as far as being a uh, very conservative and Christian. But I felt like there there were guidelines that were put out there where I couldn't talk to a patient and counsel a certain way, give them options like, oh, this is the only way to do this, or why can't nutrition be an option? Why does it have to be just pharmaceutical? Or sometimes people choose like to get certain vaccines like in their schedule, right? And maybe they don't want that. Well, that mm-hmm. shouldn't be something like, oh, if you don't get this, I'm not going to take care of you. You know, whereas when I was in my training, I would have lots of patients would come to me who would sit in the waiting room along with other people who whose children were vaccinated and patients who weren't. But we didn't ever say we can't take care of you. We just said if we're protected with our vaccines, we'll take care of the people, right? And so those are things that I I encountered, and I just felt like it didn't make sense to me. We should be have a choice, and we shouldn't force anybody to do anything or tell them this is the only option when there are other options out there. So <clears throat> in the past four years, I would say that I write fewer prescriptions as I feel that parents uh, are coming to me asking for alternatives to to a prescription. They want diet. They want counseling. They want to just know, is this something that needs surgery or is this something normal? And oftentimes that's because they're looking for second, third, or fourth opinions because they don't feel like they're being heard. like. They'll come to some doctors and they feel there's an agenda and a plan already and nobody really listened to their question. So those are the things that I feel that has changed a lot. And I feel that there's a freedom in how I approach medicine. And I'm actually being able to offer patients more options than I had when I was, you know, with a, a hospital setting. Yeah, I mean, it's great to hear because I know that I've said for years I had take my dad to the doctor quite a few times over the years. And you'd see some doctors that wouldn't even look up from their laptop Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, you know, they'll throw pills at you all day long. And Mm -hmm. I've always been like, you never ask about their diet. Mm -hmm. You never ask like, Hey, what kind of food is he eating or anything like that? It's just, here's a pill. I'm going out the door. Mm -hmm. And I know that in, Especially with when the the pandemic happened, and uh, it it to me it got really silly about yeah. the the vaccines and the and yeah. yeah just the hard line of if you don't get it you you're evil and myself my wife my mother in law none none of us are vaccinated yeah and we've actually I I got COVID once. My wife's never had it. Muscle Law's never had it. Now, my wife's stepsister, she's a, a nurse and been vaccinated 15 times and ha- has gotten COVID 15 times. Yeah. <laughs> so it's yeah. just like yeah. everybody's I've different. Seen that. Yeah. yeah, I've seen that. I've seen many people who've been boosted and they've, been, they've not only got, got the COVID, they had other viruses on top of that and pneumonia. And they were sicker than the people who weren't. And so I wasn't vaccinated. I chose that for different reasons, but definitely religious exemption because of how it was made. But I also, I have family members who were, but I never, you know, questioned their judgment. That was their choice. And they, as long as they were informed about the risk and the benefits and the fact that it didn't fully protect them, you know, and like what was claimed. (laughs) And then also they, they analyzed their own risk factors and the information that was provided for them at the time. So, and I definitely was never, never pushed anyone to like, you have to have it unless if you don't, I won't take care of you. That shouldn't be ever. Somebody asked me why I felt that way. Well, my family's background from communism, that's what led me to really have discernment on freedom. You know, it's your body, right? And you should, as, even as a healthcare professional, why are you getting fined and losing your license and getting privileges taken away over decisions that you 
trained for as a physician and you should be able to read information and analyze and what's best for you. So I knew doctors and nurses who didn't get the vaccine, worked at the hospital and were being fined every month from their paycheck for not getting the vaccine. And some of them even lost yeah. jobs for that reason. But in, in some cases, they've regained their jobs or won major, you know, <laughs> lawsuits <laughs> re related to conscience, rights and freedom. Because they were being forced to do something and the information at that time was, you know, conflicting at best. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember when all that was going down and even at, at my work, it, it, it literally, it almost came to where if you don't do it, you, you'll be fired. Mm -hmm. Luckily that did not happen. But I just remember, like you said, like communism, I'm like, People are losing their livelihoods, losing their jobs that they've had for years, 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 because they don't want to put this, this vaccine that was rushed through, like there's mm -hmm. no medicine that's ever been approved so mm -hmm. quickly, ever. Yep, ever. <laughs> and I'm just like, like it no. takes years and years and years and years, years to get anything. If they come yeah. up with a new aspirin, it would take five years to get approved. And magically they had this vaccine mm -hmm. in less than a year, boom, mm -hmm. you know. Try to yeah, and the other thing, too, yeah, and the other thing with science is like you should have different perspectives. So there's like research studies out there on alternatives or even risk factors or risks or complications, even to this day. And why are those types of science and studies being censored? Right, mm -hmm. that's not free exchange of ideas, and science can only grow if you have that. So those are just kind of some clues that made me feel like so something sinister was happening, and. You had to admit that. And if you had skills of discernment, that's how you know. And not just like, oh, have somebody tell you what to do. Well, tell me why. Give me the evidence. Give me the data. And that's how I approached it. And my husband's a physician, right? And so we had, you know, talks about it. And we personally made our own choices. And same thing. He had, he had family and friends who were physicians. They made their choices. But you make your choices if you're informed and you you know, sign the forms and you just know the risks and that's fine. But nobody should force you to get, to get something that it's a matter of life and death or it's a matter of losing a job or your livelihood. That's just ridiculous. I mean, especially in America compared to other countries like my country where I, I, where I left. Yeah. I remember, uh, I can't remember his, his whole name, but was it, was it the doctor, Dr. Malone? Yes. I think yes. It's Robert, yeah, Robert, Mo yeah, Robert Malone. Yeah. Yeah. And he came out and he had a, a different point of view and they literally tried to ruin his life. I mean, mm -hmm. lost his license, all kinds of, just cause he was like, Hey, this is an alternative mm -hmm. to this. And Dr. I know Peter, Peter McCullough, mm -hmm. another one. Yeah. So that's some examples and there's still, there's still doctors, you know, currently speaking yeah. out and publishing things that. They're not well received, but they feel that it's their duty, right, to share what mm -hmm. is known, so that people can make informed decisions, just like anything else. So, I know that. I remember when all the COVID stuff was happening. I mean, you had it was kind of like a, it was almost like a black market. Like if you wanted like hydrochloroquine or ivermectin, if you wanted to do any kind of alternative mm -hmm. to the vaccine, and there's like. You had like sneak to this one doctor to yeah. <laughs> to get the prescription because mm -hmm. people were, like I said, they were losing their jobs for well, yeah. prescribing mm -hmm. something different. And that's yeah. like, to me, it's not America. That's communism. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, like I said, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I'm definitely, I definitely question things mm -hmm. and usually follow the money. Usually, usually will get you in the right. <laughs> <laughs> get you I in the agree. right space. And I just think like going back to medical training, we've always been told something called informed consent. Informed consent, you know, involves explaining mm -hmm. the the procedure or the treatment and risk benefits, indications, and also alternatives. People forget that. There should always be alternatives. And if it's there, it's your moral duty to provide that. So, and I, th I think in life, there's very few things that are absolute, there should always be an, an alternative, you know, the alternative would be, I don't want that treatment <laughs> and what would happen if I don't take it and that's it.
So even if that I don't take it means I might die and that you're informed of that, that should still be an option, not forced into anything. Yeah. Yeah, I have to I mean, re remind my wife on occasion, you know, she'll go to the doctor and suggest something. And she's like, I really don't want to do that. I'm going, well, don't. Like, mm -hmm. they they work for you. Yeah. <laughs> you don't work for them. Yeah. Just because you have options, mm -hmm. you know, if you don't mm -hmm. like what they're offering, then go to a different, mm -hmm. another so, opinion. Yep. Yeah. Just because they say it doesn't mean you have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, so they work for you, not the other way around. <laughs> All right. So we covered a lot of ground. I think uh, which direction you want to go go in. So you say that you, you're you're part of a group of faith based healthcare. So mm -hmm. if somebody listening mm -hmm. right now wanted to somehow get connected with that group and maybe do like telehealth or, or, or things of that nature mm -hmm. or try to have a more holistic approach uh, to yep. medicine. So how, how would they get yeah. in contact? So it's called mycatholicdoctor.com. So M-Y-Catholic-D-O-C-T-O-R.com. When you go on the website, you can search by specialty, you can search by state, and which doctors are licensed in that state. Also, there's like services that uh, we offer, so they can certainly look at that. And we also have the option to do, it's called a beneficiary inquiry. So a lot of times people will say, oh, I don't know if my insurance will cover that service from that doctor, or are they part of the you know, insurance group that's credentialed. And so you can actually send an email at info at mycatholicdoctor.com and ask your question. So sometimes the, the question will be, oh, my child has this condition or these symptoms. Is this something you can help him with? So they don't want to schedule the appointment unless they know they're choosing the right doctor. So I've had questions like that. I'm like, sure, absolutely. And if you're concerned about insurance, email this person and we have somebody Several people that work on checking insurance before they schedule the appointment. But I mean, I I can't think of a single time in the last four years where somebody didn't didn't leave the visit not satisfied. So <laughs> they and the biggest thing I would say is that the amount of time we spend with the patient. They never felt rushed mm -hmm. and they felt their questions were answered. And I think that that's really the key. So you know, we're not, we never look at ourselves as we're God and we have all the answers and all the treatments, but we look at how can we listen and work with you to answer your questions, uh, alleviate your concerns and get to a diagnosis and a treatment that you're comfortable with. And that's really the goal. So I think people feel that care. We feel, they feel the, the time we spent and that, uh, the compassion that is there. Okay. Um, what if I'm not Catholic? Can doesn't I matter. <laughs> doesn't matter. Uh, okay. We take care. We take care of everyone. Um, but when people come to see us, they just know where we stand as far as our faith and things that we can do. You know that is guided by by our faith. And so that's the difference. You know, when I worked in in non faith based care, a lot of people would come with the expectation that I'm supposed to just do something. And it may go against my faith, but they're expecting that to happen, you know. Uh, so that's that's a freedom that I feel like there's a peace in my heart and a joy knowing that I'm not doing something differently personally versus professionally. And you come home from work or come off a visit and just feel peace because you're like everything is so cohesive in your life and your thoughts and your beliefs and your practice. And you're not a different person at work versus at home. Well, I think that is great. I'm very happy that you were you found <laughs> found the alternative to the um, the typical uh, salary doctor job, and you're able mm -hmm. to practice your faith and be able to give people options. You don't feel feel obligated to do something that goes against uh, your beliefs. And I'm sure there's tons of other doctors out there that are probably well, in a similar boat that you were in and 
probably don't know that hey, there's an alternative. Mm -hmm. Or, but yeah, I, I'm, I've always been a fan of the more holistic type doctors. Had some in the past that were just great, and I'm not a huge pill person, which mm -hmm. goes against the the American pill popping way of life. Yeah, and I've had doctors like, hey, take some fish oil or this, that, and mm -hmm. other multivitamin, and yeah, we'll come back and we'll check your blood work and stuff rather than just, mm -hmm. oh, here's your blood pressure's a little high, and here's a pill, here's a pill, here's a pill. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And like, no, my blood pressure's high probably because I need to lose weight mm -hmm. or my family has I a agree. history. Of yeah, and high I think, I, yeah, and I think the root, getting to the root cause of it is more important, right? And, and I think it takes time to get to the root cause. So, you know, for instance, like in my specialty, kids, lots of kids, like th at least 30% of the, the practice is related to constipation. Well, it's very easy to go, you're constipated, yeah. here's a pill or here's a medicine to treat your constipation. But like, it's harder to sit down and go, why are you constipated? You know, let's look at your diet, your fluid intake, what's going on? And when you get to the root cause, then we don't need the medications. And it's a lifestyle change that can be sustained, you know, for a long, long time. So that's just a very brief example of that's the difference of getting to the root cause. The other thing I will say is in faith-based care, here's the beauty. I never worry about telling a patient, I'll pray for you. What can I pray for you? Because they just know they came to a faith-based care. Whereas working in regular care, it was just like, man, can I tell them that I'm going to pray for them? You know? And it's like, are they going to be okay? But it's like, you really want to because you know that prayer is so important. And spiritual health is important in healing physically and mentally. And so, so that's like, I mean, that's the freedom that I feel. It's like, it's like a natural progression of who I am and how I carry that into my profession. Oh, because if you tell the wrong person, hey, I'm going to pray for you, the next thing you know, they're <laughs> yelling and screaming at your boss and they feel offended <laughs> and might want to file a lawsuit. Just... There's, yeah. there, there are those people out there that's looking for a reason, but yeah, I, mean, I definitely, definitely understand that by working for government agencies and stuff and the majority of my life. And I mean, it's, you have to be careful because you, know, you are a representative of that government agency and mm -hmm. you don't want to say anything that's going to shine a negative light on, uh, yep. like I said, whether it be the, a government agency or a hospital or anything like that. Yeah. And there's a lot of people out there just looking to be offended mm -hmm. uh, over the most trivial things. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. and when yeah. When to... I worked in secular care, it was like the people that I would pray with or talk about prayer were the ones that they already knew me in community or they knew me at church or, or a doctor referred them to me who also shared my faith. So that's like the rare occasions where I felt the freedom and the opportunity to, to talk about that. But it's something I'm passionate about, you know, so it's hard for me to not live it and not, not counsel or not talk to people in that way. Yeah. Yeah. And it, like I said, having a passion and having to having those goals, having that drive. I mean, that's, you know, trying to find that purpose. And I'm a firm believer in everybody has a purpose. And I've tried to tell people like, Hey, get out there, help, help your fellow man, help people. Trust me. It's better than any, any drug that you'll ever do. Uh, it, it'll actually make you feel better <laughs> mm -hmm. and you know, try to find ways to give back. You know, mm -hmm. it's, you can go the, the AA, NA route, like giving, giving back service and things of that nature. It's like, yeah, it's the reason why it's in there because it makes you feel good. I know growing up, the last thing I ever thought I would be helping people. I always thought I was going to be like a, a FBI agent or a fireman or something like that. It was still in the kind of the helping field, but then I ended up working with incarcerated individuals, alcohol and drug mm -hmm. treatment, domestic violence offenders, anger management, and been doing that for you know a decade. Mm -hmm. and now I've looking at possibly, you know, start my own nonprofit. So I can get out there and try to help more people and mm -hmm. have people have more access because I, I live in a, a semi-rural county and there's not a lot of access to 
alcohol, drug treatment, behavioral health, education, things of that nature. And I'm really looking at how can I be of service or be a benefit to my community because this is where I live. You know, I'm, <laughs> I, I want to be safe. I don't want to worry about somebody robbing me or to try to get money for, for drugs and whatnot. So yeah, I'll offer those services out there because like, like with anything, you know, everything costs money mm -hmm. and especially alcohol and drug treatment is very expensive. Like especially if you go to a facility, you know, you're looking at thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars and mm -hmm. not everybody has that. Yeah. So, yeah. But yeah, you know, I think the other thing too is I I wanted to mention with my nonprofit, it's completely privately funded, and you know, with I had a an uncle who passed away November twentieth, twenty twelve, and he was never married, had no children, worked until he was sixty two, and died of throat cancer, and never smoked in his life. And, but he left, you know, a legacy with, with the, a trust and has, we've been able to manage that trust after he passed to help support lots of charities. And occasionally my nonprofit will get benefit from that on a, you know, maybe every other year, if not every year. But he inspired me to start charity funds. And so my mom passed away in December, 2021 and my dad in April, 2018. So I decided through the grief and mourning, turn that into a positive started charity funds that will not only help my nonprofit, but in the future for other charities. So if you're thinking of a nonprofit, think of how you can self-fund by investing into charity funds and then using the investment and the gain from that to support your nonprofit privately and not depend on red tape from you know grants and government agencies. Because those don't last and there's just a lot of paperwork involved and you're kind of limited on how you want to help people in certain circumstances. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's definitely something that I've, it's kind of held me back because I'm like, I don't know how, you know, the, the mystery that is grant writing. I'm like, mm -hmm. well, I got to learn how to write grants first. Yeah. But there are foundations and organizations out there that will assist nonprofits. So, yeah. but yeah, I mean, it'd be awesome to just be private funded and not have to worry about, okay, I got to check all these boxes because this is a government grant. and. Yeah. You yeah. know, all, like I said, all that red tape. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I, I might I might have to uh, to holler at you later on if I decide to make that step. Uh, Any kind of kind of help me with all that. <laughs> I saw I had people reach out, you know, several weeks ago when they knew I had a nonprofit. I helped other people start their own nonprofit because they understood they understood the steps that are involved. And mm. just like anything, it may seem overwhelming when you break it down to one step. You know, next step, next step, and then it gets accomplished. So it's a great feeling to know that your personal experience of navigating something helped somebody else do exactly what you did or the passion that they're pursuing. Yeah. Real quick, so you get uh, myclassicdoctor.com. What about your nonprofit? What's the easiest way for somebody to, to look into that if they want to donate or, or things sure. like that? Sure. So it's faithful, the two, fitness.org. And we also have a Facebook page. It's facebook.com slash faithful to fitness, the number two. So my, I have a website that is, it's mdkatrina.com, very easy. And it includes all the information, like all my books, several videos, of podcasts. So I work in, as a speaker, telemedicine and my nonprofit. So if they're just looking for one place that has all of that, or they can go to the individual website. Yeah. All right. So that's just kind of a one-stop shop. Okay. Okay. Because I always Even... get asked that, oh, where can you get your books? And I'm like, well, instead of going to Amazon and that, just go to my website and it has it all listed there. All right. Well, thank you so much for being on. I don't want to take up any more of your time. but uh... Thank you. No, thank you so much for having me in the show. And I look forward to, you know, in the future and whatever, whatever I can do to help you with starting your nonprofit. Oh, well, thank you so much. I will definitely, definitely take you up on that. I look forward to, to talk with you in the future.